I will start my speech with a quote uh, from uh, President Jeff Kennedy. He said that I believe in the separation of, uh, I believe in America, in which the separation of church and state are absolutes. Uh, I'm going to tweak this quote a little bit, and I say I believe in the separation of church and state and mosque and states from the world. Uh, I believe, and I've always been a believer, that the only way to ensure religious freedom in the world is secularism, in which all people, regardless of their religious beliefs or lack of religious beliefs, be equal under the law. As most of you know, by my weird accent, I'm not an American. Uh, I come from a country mainly known as Iraq. Uh, the country and the whole region has been destroyed for decades by religious extremists. Uh, anybody uh, are familiar with the civil war in Iraq and uh, what's going on within the Middle East? No, for a fact that it's not all the result of President George W. Bush making a war against the country. It's been something that has been going on for decades. And anybody who suggests that, like the people who I call the apologists for terrorism, are living in an alternative universe. I'm sick and tired myself of whenever I go to places uh, which are filled with these apologists, in which they tell me that, oh well, Islam is a religion of peace. Uh, that is uh, disgraceful for somebody uh, who, personally, this belief is very common within the academia. And the reason I think for that is there is a successful marketing strategy uh, started by the Muslim groups and within the especially the lobbyist groups in Washington, D.C. and others, who have successfully aligned Islam with race, uh, which is as funny as possible, somebody can imagine, but they, they have kind of created a shelter against uh, Islam and made it immune from criticism to the way that anybody criticizes Islam is now labeled as a racist. So anybody within the academia is afraid of talking about Islam because, oh, I don't want to be called a racist. We are a multicultural country and we have to respect people of all cultures. But here is what I believe in. I believe that humans have rights, but cultures don't. The moment that cultures do not respect the human rights, our culture is not worth of respecting. And that includes all cultures around the world, not merely the Islamic one. Uh, I'm sorry, but this piece is very serious. I know you're having good fun. Uh, 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 so let's go back to the details. Uh, right? about, uh, I told uh, Peter that I'm going to talk a bit about the Middle East, even though that's something that not everybody's cup of coffee. Uh, which is, I'm going to talk about three countries that I've been to and I have uh, done a lot of research about. Uh, Baghdad, where I come from, Beirut, the capital of Lebanon, and Damascus, capital of Syria. Three capitals of the Middle East which are destroyed by religious hatred, religious extremism. Uh, let's go back to uh, Iraq. Uh, and that's where secularism needs to be always talked about. Iraq has been, let's talk only about the last 50 years in Iraq, has been controlled by a misogynist, disgusting monster, mainly named as Saddam Hussein, uh, who one of his biggest crimes is not only killed millions uh, of Iraqis, but rather destroyed the civil society of Iraq. Um, and he is a Sunni person uh, who have the leaders of the military, everything used to be controlled mainly by Sunni Muslims, uh, have kept the Shias, which are the majority, from taking power. After the United States intervention, democratic elections happened in the, when I was doing a report on how Iraqis voted, the Sunni Iraqis voted for Sunni uh, politicians. Shia Iraqis voted for Shia politicians. Kurdish Iraqis voted for Kurdish politicians. The Shias took power because the Shias controlled the majority. The Shias refused to share power with the Sunnis because uh, Islamists don't believe in democracy. So civil war sprang up. Obviously, the Sunnis felt threatened uh, because they've always been controlling the country. Uh, you have the prime minister of Iraq, the previous one, David said the uh, current one is terrible, said that, well, uh, the Shias are majority, and Sunnis, if you want to fight, let's do it. This is a statement said by a prime minister. And then he, when he shows up on CNN, he says, I'm not sectarian. That's a joke. I mean, when somebody says a statement like this, 
obviously, it's a very sectarian, and what what now the recent ha uh, ha what happens now in Fallujah, people are familiar with the news in which the Al Qaeda forces have pre-controlled parts of Western Iraq, is mainly because it, even his policy could not even reach to the moderate Sunni, and that's something that the general of the United States, the military general back, back then, who was named Jesse Petraeus, who later became the head of the CIA, was able to do. So imagine that the American general was able to get the modern Sunnis into the, the power, while the Shia Islamists cannot, because they are sectarian. Uh, so, I mean, the topic of Iraq is very strong. And then when you talk about it, like, when I talk about it with the academia, I talk about people, uh, like, like you see, Berkeley and others, and they say, well, it's about economics. People fight because of economic reasons. And when was the last time somebody blew himself for his vessel healthcare? <laughs> or somebody blew himself because he believes in voucher school and stuff like that. Uh, it's a crazy. They just don't want to make Islam, they just don't want to blame it. They just want to try to find their religion because criticizing religion is a taboo within the world, unfortunately. Uh, and, and here's what I, what I think, like this, this wonderful quote uh, from Steven Weinberg, who is a hero of mine. He said, with or without religion, you can, you can see people, good people doing good things, evil people doing evil things. But for good people to do evil things, that needs religion. Uh, and you, you'll see that the people who are fighting the civil war in Iraq, and there is also a recent story, let's bring back to this country, in Arizona, uh, just a few years ago, a, guy, a father who was a new Iraqi immigrant, like me, uh, but unfortunately I don't want to be associated with him, uh, he has killed his daughter for dating an American guy. And the reason he did it is called, he, because he's not a Muslim. And he explained that. Uh, and see, I mean, look, look. And, and this person actually believes, after I interviewed uh, from Daily Mail, Telegraph, and so many other news outlets, he actually believed that he was doing the right thing. When he killed his daughter for dating a non-Muslim guy, he, was, he believed that he was doing the right thing. And he, he said that I don't want her to commit further sins. So I killed her so I can protect her so she didn't go to heaven. This needs to stop. I need some water, by the way. Uh, let's go back to another country, uh, which is, I think, now, which has pretty much lost in the media, pretty much, uh, which is Syria. Now, Syria, there are so at the beginning, the revolution started in 2011 by mainly liberal sectorists who tried to create a free country, etc., etc. Both sides who are now fighting, Bashar al-Assad, uh, who belongs to the Shia faction uh, of uh, Shia, the faction of Shia Islam, versus the Sunnis led by the Free Syrian Army. And now there is a war happening between the revolutionaries in Syria. Of who is the true Muslim? Uh, so the, the Free Syrian Army, which is quote unquote moderate, uh, thank you, uh, quote unquote moderates, even though the word moderate has overall means something else in the Middle East compared to America, I always talk about it, say it's like getting stoned in America means something else than getting stoned in the Middle East. Uh, <laughs> because words mean something different when we talk. When you talk about moderates and liberals within Middle Eastern society, you talk about a Muslim or a, a Islamist who does not believe uh, in killing people because of religion. That's what we identify as liberal, not as a person who believes in gay marriage and all. This is pretty much an American Western definition, but our definition is the dimension of getting stoned. Uh, so you've got in Syria people fighting each other. Now, there's a civil war within a civil war, mainly uh, based upon people believing in imaginary things uh, about uh, uh, people are familiar with what Sunnis and Shias are, I and mean, it's pretty much simple definition. It's all about the successor of who of the Prophet Muhammad of Islam. So they, if they are fighting over stuff happened 1,400 years ago, I mean, who would believe that? In the 21st century, there are people who still believe they kill other people because of something happened 1,400 years ago, in which there is a disagreement of who should follow the Prophet of Islam. Lebanon. Another uh, beautiful country, which is sometimes called the Paris of the Middle East, uh, Beirut, a 
country of long heritage of art and literature. Uh, they have an agreement because of the religious civil war happened between the Christians and Muslims that the prime minister of the country has to be a Sunni Muslim. The president has to be a Christian Maronite, and the speakers of the parliament have to be a Shia Muslim. This is this is Lebanon. They have the, this is how the government in Lebanon is being designed. And now, obviously, it doesn't work, and people are killing each other because of it. Uh, so, it's a sad story, obviously. Uh, and and here's what I think. I mean, let's now go into the positive uh, story, which is pretty much what I've been doing for uh, Global Second Agreements Movement, uh, and what now I'm working with. Global Second Organized Strategy is not started by me, it's started by Mr. Sean Falcroft, who, who used to be a director of strategy and policy for the Dalton Foundation, previous executive director for Secular Corruption for America, previous congressman as well, he also has a long resume uh, of organizing uh, secularists, etc. cetera. Uh, and here's what I believe. I believe that now is the time for secularists and people who are social liberal who believe in separation of church and state to unite and to be a powerful force in society. And we're starting first, uh, obviously, I mean, I still work with other nations, but we're now focusing on America. And we have an action plan that can be seen on our website, globalsector.org. Uh, I can, uh, people can uh, go for, we have a long, uh, short, term, uh, short term vision and long term vision, but well, long-term vision is to organize uh, secularists and people, sorry, and all people who believe in separation of church and state, not necessarily atheists, because there are people who are genuinely, who are religious people, but they, they believe in separation of church and state, because as I mentioned, it's the only way to protect religious freedom. The only way to protect Muslims from killing each other is not to have an Islamic government. It may sound ironic, but that's how it works. That, that's pragmatism. Uh, so we have action plan. So long-term action, long action plan, which I think is something that may interest all of you, is we're trying to create 50 conferences all across the uh, states of the union in which there's a conference, let's say, in the state of Missouri, in which people come, come over here and talk about things that matter into their own state and, and laws that matter into their own state. Uh, so we try to create a shift in how atheist conferences, secular conferences work. And like you go to other conferences, you see people who are national speakers talking about things that on a national level, but we're trying to focus on state level and state legislators. So that's pretty much it. I want to do a fast speech and I want to open Q&A time. So thanks so much for listening. And thank you for Was my accent understood? <laughs> How long have you been here in the United States? Uh, ten months. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, kind of. Maybe the will. I mean, I've been to 25 states so far. I'm at trouble and work all the time, so I think my experience has been pretty much big. <laughs> but, um, I came here as a refugee. Actually. How did that even happen? How did that even happen? Well, uh, I do want to go into personal stories and stuff, but no, it's okay. Uh, my eldest brother was killed in uh, 2007. In Iraq. Uh, my cousin and my best friend were killed. Uh, so I had to escape the country. I left Iraq actually by the end of 2009. And um, if asylum took three years for me to come to America. And within this period, I think in Lebanon and Southeast Asia for the studies and came over here. So I'm actually too. That's how I get That means basically I had to hide and. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I mean uh, yeah, I was wrong. Well, I didn't hide in case. Uh, <laughs> I mean, but it was 
Yes, yes. I, I mean, it, it was really difficult. Is I never knew actually. I mean, here's what I, my most difficulty. I mean, I when I got a, like I still remember when I applied for United States uh, asylum and and I got obviously a long list of death. And he said like we all only need five. Well, you have a lot, but we're all in these five, so <laughs> five is enough. Um, the, I mean, I, I would consider myself in some sense uh, lucky because, well, I got accepted. Because not all people uh, have that privilege, uh, number one. And number two, I, I know I speak English, so that helped me a lot in, well, kind of, not speak English. Uh, kind of helped me get great, pretty quick in the in society. Uh, I, I think is one of the... Main problem is like I, before I applied for the kingdom actually, uh, and I get rejected because they need fifty thousand pounds in that account to apply for asylum, uh, which is kind of weird. Culturally, you have to admit certain Well, yeah, the food. I would say. <laughs> Not in Bronson, actually, but I was able to, <laughs> <laughs> I was able to find something you missed. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, it's everything in this world is a trade-off, you know. Uh, you, I, I mean, I, I'm not like very much of a nationalist, to be honest. Uh, I always identify myself as a global citizen. Uh, I hardly identify myself as an Iraqi. I, I think that the definition of home is where you get appreciated and accepted, other than the country that you were born into. Uh, thank you. <laughs> it's, uh, so I, I mean, when you've got a country that, uh, country that was, I mean, I was 22 years old, uh, and I lived in Iraq for about 20 years, and I lived in three wars, one after the other. Uh, it's, you don't really love your country much when you have, uh, when you go to your high school and you have to walk on dead bodies to go to your high school. You you feel, uh, and plus when you got, I mean, when it comes into the, after my uh, brother was killed and everything, and uh, so much betrayal of people, like when I, as I mentioned, like hiding between place to place, and most people will say, oh well, I don't want a dead friend. Maybe if I bring you to my home, you, I will get problems. So find another place and things of that sort. So I, yeah, I don't really have much of, uh, I mean, obviously it's a country that I have this morning, uh, it's a country that speaks the first language, I mean, the first language is Arabic, um, and I'm, I'm always going to be Iraqi, whether I like it or not. But uh, I think I'm lucky to have come here at a young age. I think that also plays a role. Uh, for some people who come in older ages, they find that it's like kind of a difficulty to integrate and kind of, uh, and, uh, but, I mean, considering, you, yeah. You must miss a lot of cooking. And yeah, I mean, and I've got that. It's, it's, it's not only all, only that. It's like now when I look at reports, because I, I work as a research assistant for a, a for an institute in Stanford, and I, I get a continuous reports from the Middle East, and I see that the, most of the places I've been to are now just so like I look at the pictures and like I look at my photo album that I was standing right there and then I look at the picture and it's not anymore. The place is not anymore. The restaurant is not anymore. Uh, that obviously, I mean, makes me sad. And, and uh, but there is, I mean, what I you mean, can do, you know? I mean, do you just? I must miss a lot. I mean, alcohol helps. <laughs> 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 you, you, I mean, as I said, I mean, I, I, I think, I, I mean, just to uh, finish up with this, it's like, since I, when I arrived in the States, uh, I created uh, a policy, which is I tried to create new memories to replace the old memories. And that's why I've been so active, as I mentioned, probably in the 25 states. I have wonderful California here. Uh, I have great friends uh, around the country is to try to build a new memories. So this will kind of balance out the bad ones that I've got over there. And I mean, I'm not planning to go back anytime. Uh, I may go for a visit, but not for a living. Um, 
Oh, uh, what's her name? You mentioned traveling to a bunch of countries and that you got, or bunch, I'm sorry, a bunch of states, and that you've got an initiative to try to get states to pull together as opposed to the nation. Have you noticed any pushback from different states that you wouldn't have expected pushback from? Because I know around here more states are a little liberal or a little more conservative. Have you been surprised by the response that you've gotten in the states that you've been to? I would say, well, it's kind of surprising that most of the acceptance we got are the uh, states which are concerned Bible Belt. Because there are more, most activists are. There are the people who are really serious of like getting separation of church and state. Uh, not all states in America are equal. I mean, I live in Washington, D.C. and in the Northeast. Uh, it's actually, most of the questions you get, you got is why are you religious, not why are you an atheist? You know, uh, when you go to Harvard and New Hampshire and the states up, up in the north, um, the majority of people don't really care about religion. And you see that laws over there are not, not it's, I mean, atheist activism, secular activism is not something that interests the people over there. But if you go into the state of Alabama or the state of Mississippi or Texas, uh, where I spent some time in, you see it in Houston, actually, it's the first city I've lived in the United States. Uh, they ha their atheist group have about 2,500 people. And you see that most of them are interested about what Rick Perry is doing and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, because he's making laws that, that are anti, but if you go anti human rights, because uh, human rights are human rights, so it's not. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I mean, the sovereign, I, I would say, well, uh, we have great success. I mean, we have branches now. Uh, we have like groups in California and uh, Florida and Oregon and Vermont and uh, some other states. So we're trying to reach out. I mean, the website there is a volunteer form. Uh, I'm the public relations director. And the, the volunteer management is managed by somebody else uh, who, who actually put the people in front of their state. I mean, so far, I think we have 2,500 volunteers. Uh, the organization has been started pretty recently, but I've been working my ass off <laughs> pretty hardly uh, and getting the message out there. And I'm, we're, we're trying to get as many people as possible. I mean, this is this is for all of us. Awesome. Uh, I'll stand up so you can hear me. Uh, do you think that the sectarian violence in Iraq was inevitable, and uh, what lesson do you think we can draw from that for our dealings with the rest of the world? Very good question. I think I think that I'm very. I I, I mean, the question of the war always come up because I speak on foreign policy a lot. Um, I am supportive of the war in principle, but not in management. Uh, the management has been a failure, in my opinion. I think that there have there should have been many much, uh, much more uh, work in trying to reduce the effects of the religious war. Um, and it was pretty much understood that if you go to a society, that the civil society has been ruined. Uh, religion has played a very major role of society. There is no way that the civil war is not going to happen. Uh, one of the, I think, main mistakes that the administration uh, has done, uh, which is kind of, this is not popular opinion within the people who comment on Iraq, but it was the elections. Uh, Iraqis have no idea what democracy is. I mean, I'm one of them. We have no idea. For decades, we have been living in the dictatorship. People look in, for the Shias, they looked at democracy as a way to control the masses. They're the majority, and they think that Democracy is the best way for the majority to screw anybody else, uh, and I think that had been that had been if, if, if at the beginning if the United States installed a, a pretty much secular liberal government, which was led by a guy called Ad Alawi. He's a graduate of MIT, pretty smart guy, pretty secular guy. He launched a war against Sunni extremists, Shia extremists, to the way that Sunnis and Shias were comfortable having him as a leader. Then the elections came in, Shia have won. And as a statement, as I mentioned, by the prime minister who have won, oh well, it's time we have won, now Sunnis, if you want to have a war, let's do it. And obviously, I mean, not, not to say that all major problem is because of what the government, the Iraq government has done, but obviously played a very major role. Uh, there was a 
And that has been tried to create a resolution when General David Petraeus and, and leaders of the assassination created what's called the Awakening Movement, if people are familiar with it, in which they reached out to the moderate Sunnis to for them to fight Al Qaeda. And it worked. But then, after the United States withdrawal from Iraq, the Iraqi Prime Minister Al Maliki cut their salaries intentionally. And, and now he's launching a war using the army against them. So that obviously, I mean, if you ask me, if I was a leader of the country, I would have done it much differently. But uh, yeah, and, and it, it, I mean, I wouldn't say that the civil war would not have happened, but it would have reduced that. It would not have hundreds of thousands of people killed. The same thing goes with Syria. I mean, there have, would have been much more solutions uh, coming from the inside or from the international community that would have reduced what's going on. But uh, within, within Syria, you have a war, people killing each other. And then you've got the US administration, uh, every day, uh, Hillary Clinton says something else. What's the name? And they don't really have a policy. I mean, uh, the same thing goes with, with Egypt. Like, people are familiar with how the Egypt, Egyptian Arab Spring happened. And I was like doing the report on the U.S. administration policy, and every day I watch the news, and Hillary Clinton say something else. We support the prime minister. We support uh, Mubarak. We are against Mubarak. We support Mubarak. We are partly supporting Mubarak. We are against Mubarak. That's in seven days. The U.S. administration makes six positions. Four of them are contradictory with each other, and you've got you've got no policy within the U.S. administration. You've got no policy within the European Union. So. And you've got no policy within Syria. So you can see chemical weapons have been used, people killing each other. Uh, the Arab League nations uh, supporting the rebels while Iran is supporting Bashar al-Assad. Hezbollah is supporting Bashar al-Assad. And so it's a regional war plus civil war. So yeah, it's terrible. Uh, please. Yes, uh, I had a question about Egypt. Uh, have you watched Arab Spring and all of that? I can, I can only speak for myself, but I had very high hopes, you know, in the beginning. Most of us do, yeah. And is there any way for someone like myself to better understand the degradation and, and what happened? Why did that all fall apart? It looked like such a solid step forward, and then it just fell off the cliff. Yeah, that's what I, I mean. I, I, I consider myself as like... Uh, and people are familiar with Thomas Friedman from the New York Times. Uh, I, I put in my side with him. I was not uh, one of the people who were actually optimistic of the of the Arab Spring. Uh, and MSNBC, one of the guy, MSNBC commentator, he called the Arab Spring compared it to the French Revolution. I think he was under drugs when he said that. Uh, and most mo the most reason for the for why the Arab Spring have happened. It's not because people are looking for freedom and they're fighting for a new bill of rights. Most of the reason is because they want food on the table. Uh, the, the, uh, the Egyptian economy, 95% of the economy is centered around 5% of the population. And what you've got is extreme poverty. Uh, mo uh, people are just revolting for the sake of revolting. They have no vision. They have no idea what they're doing. They say they think that we are poor, we got nothing to lose, pretty much. Uh, so they've got, uh, and obviously, uh, for dictatorships like President Barak to survive, they, just like Saddam have done, create an ignorant society, ruin the civil society, etc., etc. So most of the people know what the, don't know what they're doing. So eventually they voted for the Muslim Brotherhood. I mean, this is the same thing for Iraq. Iraq is voting for the Islamist parties, and Egypt have done it. And then you've got, the, and then the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood wanted to take over the military, so the military revolted against them, and you can see the chaos. It's, it's uh, as the, the only, uh, the, I mean, Tunisia is the only country from the Arab Spring that has not pretty much, you don't get a lot of news about it because they're not telling you things. Uh, the rest are all in turmoil. Uh, because, yeah, as I mentioned, I mean, they, most of the people have don't know that why they are revolting, other than I want food on the table, mm -hmm. and that is not a uh, policy. It's not history. Uh, yeah, it's fine. Me? Yes, yes. Uh, um, so, were you um, atheist, agnostic, whatever, at 
at what age, I mean, did, and how do you see any of that trending in the country before you left? I mean, I guess I'm asking, is there hope for there to be some kind of secular majority in the country? Uh, as for me, I mean, I don't really have a much of an interesting story when it comes to religion. I mean, I was raised in a secular family. Uh, and it's, uh, my dad is a medical doctor, my mom is a lawyer. Uh, we don't, I mean, religion was not the in the house. Uh, I was able to think for myself, uh, etc. I, I've been a deist before I was an atheist. Uh, but as for the people, I, I think I think there is more hope in Iran than there is hope in Iraq. Uh, but there is a small hope in Iraq. Uh, in Iran, because the Ayatollah regime had been controlling the country for decades, uh, he, the most of the young people are pretty much fed up with old white males telling them that they should not listen to music or they should not wear jeans, or uh, girls and boys should not go to school together. Uh, so, with, I mean, within within uh, the Iran, there is a huge rise. I mean, as far as I know, the pure research says about 60% of the people under 25 in Iran identify themselves as non-religious. Uh, so that, that is pretty good statistic. Uh, when it comes to Iraq, we don't really, yes, 65% under the age of 25 identify as non-religious. Uh, but that is not to say that they're atheists, but they're just non-religious. Religion doesn't play a part in their decisions as much as like their elders and things like that. Definitely. Uh, I see so much alcohol in front of me, that's difficult to handle. <laughs> <laughs> Like beer. Right? Right? Yeah. 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 And, and he likes it. Thank you. Catch, brother. So you think as people, as that, as that, that's, that's more than 10%. You think as they grow up, then, yes. that they will refuse to fight? Yeah, I, I think uh, the, the problem is that the, the Ayatollahs are very powerful. They have the military, they have the army on their side. Uh, but I think that if well, we, the reason, like, you can actually see that within the elections that happened recently in Iran. Uh, so, so obviously the Ayatollah, and that's how the Iranian elections work. It is the Ayatollah who decides who the candidates are. And then the people choose the candidates. So there, uh, Tom Friedman also mentioned, so there was like a dark, 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 and there was gray that was Rouhani. And you see that the majority of the young people voted for the Rouhani. Who is the moderator? He's like the least okay. evil of the uh, And he kind of, just like Katami before Ahmadinejad, like believes in women can show their hair a bit from here uh, compared to Ahmadinejad, who enforced moral police that beats women for showing a bit of their hair. So you can see that the recent elections show that the people who can vote, who are the young people, are voting for the most moderates of the evils who were the candidates of the Iranian elections. So, yeah, that's, that's Iran. Uh, as for Iraq, I think, unfortunately not. There isn't much hope when it comes to Iraq. Uh, because the, even now there is sectarian education in the public education system, in which they teach them about Sunnis and Shias and who is right and who is wrong and who is going to go to heaven, etc. Cheers, <laughs> everyone. So yeah, thank you. So yeah, I mean, uh, so yeah, the only country I'm hopeful about in the Middle East is Iran. Uh, the rest is not. That's shocking. Huh? That's shocking. Well. Um, yes, yes, I mean, I understand, I understand that. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, media is generally for profit businesses, so they try to get the, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, I, I think, I mean, there is 
little, obviously the bias exists, uh, but when, I, I mostly read reports, then read opinions. Uh, so when you, so that's what I actually care about. I mean, for opinions, like people like Tom Chomsky and others who are like sitting having a Starbucks in San Francisco telling people what this would be the solution in Iraq, uh, I don't think he got a valid opinion and, uh, <laughs> but the only person that I actually respect, uh, but unfortunately he's dead now, is Mr. Uh, who actually been to Iraq and been to the Middle East and, and been to the areas and talked to the local populations. Uh, and he, and he has books about the topic in which he explains, uh, actually, sorry, uh, he got a meeting with the grandson of the Ayatollah Khomeini, who is the leader of the Iran Revolution, he's an atheist. The grandson of Ayatollah Khomeini is an atheist. And he's out? He's, he's out. Does he live? I think so, yes. Uh, but the, the reason why they don't they cannot kill him is because he's the grandson of the Ayatollah Khomeini. I mean, if they kill him, that's most people are going to be pissed off at the government, regardless if he's an atheist or not. I mean, he's holy. He has the DNA of an imam. So, uh, yeah. So, 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 yeah, things are changing over there. And the Green Revolution, sorry. I, I, I spent so much time with Saudi Iran. Uh, it's a great country. Uh, uh, the Green Revolution, actually, was led mainly by young people who are generally liberals and seculars. But, unfortunately, and this is one of my main criticism of the and actually they asked for American support to double down the government, the Islamic government, and they got no support. So, yeah, I mean, if there is another revolution, I hope the administration would have so well more person coming after him. It seems to me like there's sort of a fundamental disconnect between the way Americans see the rest of the world, and the rest of the world sees the rest of the world. <laughs> what, what, do you th what do you think is the, pro the main problem there? I, mean, I seriously don't blame Americans if they don't really know about the Middle East. I mean, it's not, it's not something... Uh, you really have to have the mood to... If you're really looking for a headache, you're going to research about the Middle East. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if... if uh, yeah, I mean, there is also actually important is how the world views America is something that uh, needs to be talked about a lot. Uh, because there is always a question of what the Americans should do to the Muslim world. But there is very little discussion of what, what the Muslim world should do to America. Uh, because America is always known to be the big guy and we're number one. So it's like everything has to be America's policy, but not... Uh, we, we always, like within the American, we always want to talk about the Muslim world and others. We generally talk to them, I'm not a model. Yeah, we mostly talk to them when we're dealing with children and then we're dealing with adults when we talk about the Muslim world. And we have to, I think, deal with them as adults. and. Try, try to make them responsible for setting their own countries. I mean, if there is a change that's going to happen in the Middle East, despite the fact that I believe in interventionism, etc., etc., it has to come from within. You, America is not God. Do you think they try to outburst their problem in the United States? That is, that is what their leaders are doing for years. Uh, there are three people who are, or two, uh, they always, whenever, we, like that's something Saddam Hussein used to always talk about. So when there is lack of health care, a lot of poverty and stuff like this, two people he blames, the Jews and Americans. But he builds 100 mosques in the same year, using this money that could have gone to build hospitals and schools. But when there is poverty, oh, it's America that is responsible for that. It's the Jews, Israel. Don't you see they are the evil guys? Uh, and the same thing has been done for... Many other administrations, Iran, Ayatollahs are doing it, but they are, and here's one thing, of, one, I think it's one first project on health, is that they can no longer do that because of the internet and because of the excess of information. So when, when and uh, within the Arab Supreme, which are the minority of the Arab Supreme who try to do things for the better, and they look at the world around them, and they see, oh, why don't we have that here? Uh, and 
while, while the leader tell them, no, well, it's not our fault, it's not that we are corrupt and fucked up. It's the Americans or British imperialism, colonialism. They always use these isms uh, and try to outsource what is actually their responsibility. Uh, when, uh, when a Sunni Muslim kills a Shia Muslim, it is Muslims' problem, not America's problem. Uh, and while, and it's, it's kind of that's the ironic part. There is something in America called white guilt, if people are familiar with it. Uh, so when when somebody talks, like when there is a problem happens, when a, a father kills his daughter because she's dating an American guy, you hear an American commentator talk with white guilt, saying, well, it's, it's this uh, problem of American foreign policy. It's our fault. It is, we, it's uh, Bush's fault that the father killed his daughter. If, if we did not intervene, if we don't build bases in the Middle East, the father would have probably went to one with his daughter. Uh, which is very ironic within the academia, which is extremely common. Uh, the more extreme left you get within America, you will see a lot of these opinions of saying that about cultural relativism. And I was talking to a, a woman who has a PhD in anthropology, UC Berkeley. I would like to mention her story because it's very crazy. Uh, so we're talking about honor killing, the same thing I talked about, her father killing the Georgia. And she, he said, well, uh, rape is a crime in America because that's how our culture defines rape. But in, in, in Iraq, if a woman gets raped and the culture accepts that, we should respect that because that's their culture. And we have no right to tell other cultures that, that these things are wrong. So when you have such stupidity, you're not going to get a solution. Uh, last question. My voice is going to... Okay, ladies are more important. Break a little, ladies are more important. Okay, I'll go with that. So, yeah. <laughs> Friends? 
No, she, she goes to an Islamic school. Oh, an Islamic school. Yes. Okay, I thought you said she was Islamic. No. Okay. So, so, actually, and that, and that problem is also more common in Great Britain uh, than it is in the States. And there is a huge uh, rise of Islamism within the United Kingdom in which you see people demanding Sharia law. And Islamic law is a place that they place it in. And Unfortunately, you have people within the Liberal Democrats in Great Britain in which they allow them to have Sharia law. In, there is not Sharia law in Britain uh, for, the, for counties that are Muslim dominated that allows a, a man to meet his wife or meet his daughter because, yeah, that's their culture we should respect it. Back to the culture of altruism, cancer of the liberal left, unfortunately. Uh, but thankfully, not all liberals believe that. And I'm liberal myself. So, uh, but at the same time, there is within the liberal movement, we should always uh, talk about who are the culture of altruists, who try to appease uh, minorities from the what they do. I think, I mean, as a new immigrant myself, uh, I want to be part of America. I came here to this country. Uh, it's my choice. Uh, it's wrong, I think, for immigrants, especially Muslim immigrants. If you if you think that your country is awesome and it's Islamic law, then go back to where you come from. Why do you come over here and tell the country that you come into to follow Islamic law? Why would you like Islamic law go to Pakistan? But they don't go to Pakistan. They come over here using using the freedom of speech, freedom of religion to impose their standards of living, which felt in their own home countries. But because they they don't, they, they always think that uh, Islam is the best software ever. Uh, they can they think always less of other systems. And they think that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood slogan is Islam is the solution. For me, my slogan is Islam is the problem. Uh, so that, yeah, that's that's. I think what if we can have an immigration reform, uh, it should be based upon, in my opinion, based upon values that reflect America, which is that we want people who come to this country, who uh, contribute to this country. It's a win-win for both of both of the people. That the person who has a skill set will receive more income and have a better life over here. Plus, he get a contribute to the country that he's coming to. Other than bringing somebody who receives six thousand dollars on welfare without doing anything, and then he sends his niece to the Islamic school that one day probably preaches against Islam and preaches against America and mm -hmm. and and what we have. So it's time to break the silence, time to break the spell. Don't you think that puts them at a permanent economic disadvantage when they do that? When they refuse to assimilate. Well, I mean, actually, I, I, I mean, I uh, try to try to find a way they can tell. Actually, they can. I mean, if you don't know how to speak English, uh, and and the police stops you, it's not a good idea. Uh, but uh, for for some of these people, I mean, they live on abusing the system. They will always figure out a way. In which they can, and they will say, "Well, we need translator. Uh, it's our right to have a translator." Mm -hmm. And so they use the what uh, multicultural liberal democracy values to uh, impose what they consider as the bad values. It's too much hypocrisy, uh, but they do it. And uh, I hope they fail. I mean, I hope everything wrong with this world is fail. <laughs> Certainly. Yep, I mean, <laughs> he has a bigger beard, so. They're doing that here, like what you're describing. Wouldn't they have died in their own country as well? They can't. They can't. They can't. They, 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 we don't have six thousand dollars of wealth in Iraq. Let me find another way. You sound like you're pretty resourceful. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, the, he, 
definitely, obviously, prefers life over here, over life over there. That's the reason why he came. But that's how immigration logic works. Immigration comes from a bad country. You immigrate from a bad country to a better country. You don't see a person immigrating from Sweden to Afghanistan. <laughs> you see somebody immigrating from Afghanistan to Sweden, but not the other way around. Uh, so he likes life over here. And at the same time, he's abusing the system and play around with the system to make it fit his needs. Okay. The average American doesn't get surprised. I mean, I would like to see how you would It's very unfortunate. And, and I mean, it's more, and I think, despite the fact that, I mean, obviously the Britain, British people, British government protected me for being a refugee over there, especially when they explained to them everything. But uh, the fact is, I understand why we are different. I mean, yes, I do have a copy of that hatred against them because I was having a different time and going from place to place. But there are so many people who are like me, who uh, or like me in terms of ethnicity, uh, not like me in terms of value, who, who lied and get away and came to them and tell, oh, I have a person no, I have a person no, blah, 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 this lie. They come to the UK and then they get their uh, takers from the world. But in, in some countries in Europe, there's more socialism, so they get more. Uh, so you, yeah, I mean that's that's the that's the deal. I was wondering, do you see any similarities in the increasing polarization we seem to be going through in this country with your experience, uh, some of your experiences in the Middle East? What, what do you mean by polarization? Uh, big word. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, it just uh, it seems to be, you know, in the last well, in the last eight, eight years or so, the increasing uh, emphasis, you know, especially in state laws, with uh, going back to biblical based you know, concepts and things like that. So, I mean, what, what I think is that. Like, you know, there seems to be a difficult, an increasing divide in this country because of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, well, obviously, the Christian right is, uh, is, is kind of right for the wrong reasons. Uh, they, I mean, they are very much afraid of... Uh, and here's a little call over this way, Sam Harris has talked a lot, uh, a lot about it, and he's more experienced on this issue than me. But... Uh, the Christian rights are the oldest the Christian extremists know more about Islamic extremists than liberals do. Uh, because the liberals and the people who live in the culture hardly understand how can somebody believe something and then act upon it. Uh, while the Christian rights know exactly uh, what it means to believe something so hard and act upon it. Yeah, you know, through the job, I'm a psychotherapist, and I get a lot of people you know, around here who, you know, just have this deep, visceral hatred, you know, for other cultural religions and things like that. And it seems to be increasing. I, I mean, I don't think it is, uh, I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't think that it is very much increased. I mean, there is obviously a difference between, and that is actually, I think, it's pretty much universal between how big cities and you immigrants versus small towns and immigrants. Uh, I mean, big cities, I mean, with, and he living in D.C., having a weird accent is the norm. Because everybody has a weird accent. Uh, and everybody is uh, different culture. Uh, while in small towns, people tend to have similar ethnicity or similar views. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that, well, I mean, as you can see, I mean, with this, it's legal statistics. You can, Talk about the issue of, for example, I mean, the way I see it, you see that the more places that view differences, the more society that view differences are respected, the more you see that it's linked to immigrants. So, for example, gay marriage, you'll see that there is a huge rise within the last 10 years of people accepting, accepting gay marriage. Uh, and it's something different. And same thing I think goes to immigrants is that people are trying to realize that being different sexuality, different race is not. Yeah. Uh, but obviously there is some pushback, uh, and they're getting it actually in a, in a very, like, for example, Oklahoma recently, the 
when they wanted to put the, the Ten Commandments and then suddenly the Satanists showed up and they said that we want to have our rights. And, uh, the, uh, and that's, that's how this, uh, when you break the separation of church and state, that's what happens. Uh, that's why we always have to maintain that role so the Christian rights and others will not. Uh, 
and they uh, congratulate Hitler for what he did in the Holocaust. Uh, so you've got the parties of God fighting all, all the time in that place, uh, and unfortunately, it's the Holy Land, which kind of makes the issue much more complex. Because if it was just the land, people will not be concerned that much. But because it's the Holy Land, then people believe uh, that there is a there is a like within this sorry please uh, oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> You you see like you see that like, even within the Muslim like you see that that issue that the Palestinian Israel issue is an issue that concerns most of the Muslims, and uh, ma the main reason is because uh, the the Al Aqsa Mosque, which is where Prophet Muhammad flew into heaven on a wing course, uh, and they you don't see Muslims are protesting their crimes committed in that war. Uh, the numbers of Iraqis killed within the last 30 years is four times more than the Palestinians killed for the Israelis. But you don't see Muslims too much caring about Iraqis getting killed because it's Muslims killing other Muslims. But when the Jews kill a Muslim and then the protests come up, and then, uh, so I mean, one of the reasons why there has never been a solution, in my opinion, is because the Israelis are Jews. Which is a Jewish state. If it was that when if you get people talk about occupation on <coughs> occupation, but if you, if you look at Middle Eastern history, the Ottoman Empire has been occupying that part of the world, which is Palestine and Israel, for hundreds of years. And there haven't been so much protesting going on because the Muslim Empire is a Muslim. But when a Jew that says that this is my land and occupies this place, suddenly <coughs> people get this stuff. Uh, so there is a lot of religion involved in this in this battle. Obviously as long as you take religion, people start to come safe and start to look at other, other people as human beings. Uh, but yeah, I mean my view is I mean I I don't really care if the person is a Jew or, or a Muslim, but I'm a humanist at the end. And I look at the people as human beings. And but when you have a religion con contaminates your view of life, and you suddenly start looking um, at whether you are a Jew looking at Muslims are inferior, so whether you are a Muslim looking at Jews are inferior. I mean, there's a verse in the Quran that compares the Jews with the pigs. Uh, and these are told all the time in schools and, and in mosques. Uh, or you can have a peace with somebody if you believe that the other person is inferior. Uh, peace is a two-way solution. Both sides have to believe in peace uh, to achieve peace. Uh, so that's, I mean, what this is not working out. Um, and, yeah, so, I mean, I'm in favor of two-way solution, but I'm maybe the only one. <laughs> oh, no. yeah. Hopefully. I mean, I, I hope that, I mean, at the end, I mean, the issue is Israel versus Palestine. It's not Iraqi or American. Uh, so the people within these lands have to solve it between themselves. Uh, and I think that's the solution. You start to look at each other as human beings. Yes, uh, what? Yeah. My, my very basic and understanding of Iraq it's a political fabrication that, that occurred after the First World War, basically in, in deals between France and, and England. Yes. And that they cobbled together this, this nation called Iraq, uh, basically from uh, the Sunnis, the Shiites, and the, and the Kurds. I hear you. Really after the war was initiated, no. there was talk that perhaps would be a political solution in Iraq could be a loose confederation or loose federation of those three semi autonomous states. Is that even realistic? Is that possible? Yeah, actually, yeah. I mean, what, what you talk about is John Biden, actually, is the person who proposed that, of, of creating a great different. Uh, uh, well, uh, the, uh, in my understanding, the main reason is Kurdistan is not a country at the moment, it's because of oil. Most of the Kurds in Iraq have no attachment whatsoever to Iraq. Uh, and, and I, I went to Kurdistan for at least 12 times. It's, uh, 
it's a pretty much different country uh, compared to what you ever had. They have different flags, uh, etc., etc. Yeah, they have the Sunni that uh, sorry, the Kurdish flag of Assam, other than of uh, the Iraq flag. Uh, the actually the Syrian civil war is a, is a pretty much which I think will probably relate to, to what you just said, which is uh, the Iraq, which is Sunnis are generally populated within the west of Iraq and northern Baghdad. They're going to join in within the Syrian. The Kurds, northern Kurds, Kurdistan will become the Kurdistan, and the southern of Turkey will join them plus Iran. That's a very, I mean, it's a fragile region, and, 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 and just like Sudan, which after a long civil war have uh, uh, went into two countries because of the political borders. Uh, so it is it is realistic because if people are not going to live with each other and kill each other all the time, then they would probably go and just create their own countries. Uh, and the thing is that I grew up in Baghdad, which is the capital city, and people don't really much care about Sunnis and Shias, but if you go into places like Najaf and places in the south of Iran, which is 99.9 Shias, uh, they think of Sunnis as heretics. And if you go to west of Iraq, like Fallujah, and, and which is one of the reason why Fallujah shows most of the news is because what they do to America. You have this area of Fallujah, Al Qaeda, and the extremists of the extremists, of like women killed brought for them to school. It's like the extreme. Uh, is you, they think of Shias as heretics. Uh, so how you can bring these two people together on the table? Sometimes, I mean, uh, it is not unrealistic to say that the best solution probably is that they not go to the same country. Is to everybody create his own country. Uh, I mean, I I have mixed views on this, but I mean, I, I try my best to leave whatever emotions I have about what I should be at and, and quite pragmatic and be a pragmatic person. If, if, if this solution is going to make that people kill, right, you, then you I'm okay. You know, one, uh, you know. And it seems to be like what's wrong. Most of the, like, especially now in Syria, is, is, uh, is pretty much the case. I mean, they, the, like Aleppo, which is now the, which is pretty much one of the three Syrian army and the Sunni, it's all Sunni, I guess. Uh, most of the anti Bashar al Assad uh, controlled zones are Sunni, I guess. Uh, the, one of the main reasons they are against al Assad is because he's a Shia. It's not because they believe in democracy and human rights and etc. And the main reason why, the same reason why the, the Iraqi opposition actually sold to the Americans, that was before 2003, uh, because Sunnis were controlling Iraq and the Iraqi Shias were telling the Americans, oh, if we're going to come to Iraq and then when we go to power, we're going to create a secular, multicultural democracy, etc., etc. But they don't believe that. The moment they came into power, they all, all of that. In box. They don't believe in that. So, I mean, I, I will we'll just wait and see what's happening. I don't think it's realistic, to be honest. I think it's, if, if people are insane, then there shall probably insane solutions to happen. I mean, I, I, I'm in favor of less borders than more borders. I, I'm in favor of something that the European Union, which a continent can travel between each other without using a visa, without using anything. I mean, the less borders, the better. Better for economy, better for it, uh, more integration. But if yeah, people believe in archaic beliefs, then what to do? You know? uh, unless, hopefully, within the next election in Iraq, all the uh, certain thing is going to be solved, which is to have a more popular democracy, in which they tell them, you know what, we don't care uh, whether you are Sunni or Shia, you are on the wall. But if that solution is not going to happen, then obviously the association. Not um, I've been listening to your story for a couple of years now. Oh, you're hot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, you witnessed atrocities, you experienced violence that none of us in this room can even comprehend. How, how are you being positive and how come you're not super fucking angry? <laughs> well, if not, you have a reason to hear Well, that's a, that's a good question. 